start with the Friends of the Library. Amber, do you want to kind of kick that off? Thank you. So, so I, know, I know it has my name on the agenda, but actually I brought some of my very best friends with me go. today. <laughs> and so I'm going to invite Laura Dixon up. She's going to give you a little bit of background information on what the library's friends do for us and some of the needs that they have coming up. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start by giving you the mission of the Friends of the Library. The mission of the Friends of the Casa Grand Library is to develop resources to support library services. Programs that promote adult literacy, encourage enjoyment of reading, lifelong learning, and community involvement. I'll give you a little history of our Friends of the Library. I was surprised. I didn't realize that the Friends of the Library started as long ago as it did. There were concerned citizens back in the early 1980s. And they went to the library and they got together and they started having plays, book sales, dinners, anything they could to raise money for the Friends of the Library. Um, the library, did you get our little spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. Over the past few years, we've donated over $200,000 to the city. No, to the library. Thank you. Well, yeah. You're welcome. We want to continue doing that, and that's why we're here tonight. We, um, in this last year, um, we've just pledged to assist with the purchase of a new bookmobile. And the um, outside the library, a little Wi-Fi bench so that we can help people who don't have Wi-Fi connection. They can come, they can utilize the bench, they can connect, they can become part of the internet universe. Other than that, we totally support the summer reading program. We're the ones that make sure that the summer reading program is there for the children. We give them the... Um, Overdrive, that gives you your electronic books through the library. We give people the scholastic fairs, okay? We have Vox books, little books that talk to the children. We are all about library learning and getting people involved with that process. However, we have a small problem, and that's where we're here to help hopefully get you to help us solve. Over the years, we've utilized the Women's Club, which is now the Black Box Theater. It was a wonderful venue for us. Perfect size, we could spread out. Um, when that went away, we used the Pert Center. When that went away, we went over and found space at the Casa Grande, the old Casa Grande Mall, lots of parking. We held our book sales there. Last couple, the big book sale we had was at the museum. We were there at the barn. It was, as the sites have diminished in size, the income to the friends has diminished as well. We're now down to book sales at the top floor of the main library. We appreciate the space. It's a wonderful space. Parking is good but it doesn't do what we want it to do. Here's, here's our dream, and this is supposed to be a half hour presentation, how's it gone so far? <laughs> <laughs> we need a space. We need a space, let me back up the truck. We currently utilize two spaces, one in the main library, we've got two and a quarter shelves there where we can sell books. We've got shelving at the Vista Library that we can use to sell books. Because we don't have a venue, we have stopped accepting donations. The way the process used to work was people would bring in their used books, they'd be moving, there'd be estates, donation to the Friends of the Library, we would sort the books into the genre, box them. We had a spot and a storage facility, very hot, very dusty. We'd box the books up, 
then when it came time for the sale, we would haul the books over to the sale site, set the books up, have the sale, break the books that were left over back down, box them back up, take them to the storage facility. We're old. <laughs> the average age of a Friends of the Library board, I would say, is probably mm, 62, maybe. It's, it became too much. So what we did is we stopped the donations because we didn't have a place for the sale. We're looking to you to remember us. If you have a site that comes up, I know that you, uh, the Pert Center was yours, the Women's Club was yours. We're looking for a site that we can utilize every day of the year. We have looked at the Promenade Mall and asked about a site there. Far too expensive. If we paid the lease and the utilities, we'd end up coming out of our pockets. We have looked at the Casa Grande Mall. They're not interested in us anymore. I don't know what they're doing over there, but they have no interest in giving us a space. We have contacted realtors. We've contacted just about every person that we can think of who used to have space available in Casa Grande, but you probably know we're growing. <laughs> and space is at a premium, and leases are very high. So we're looking to find a space where we can accept donations, sort them, put them on permanent shelves. We have enough members that we can monitor those sites and sell our books all the time. That will increase our income tremendously. And there's, there's so much more we can do for the library. Uh, there is so much more. Um, all Amber has to do is give us her wish list, and we would love to be able to mm -hmm. wave our magic wand and make it so. Um, we are also looking, we would, if we can't do a permanent site, if you had a space at the rec center, if you had a space anywhere else where we could, on an honor system, set up our books, we could then accept a few donations, set up the books, and put the books out on the honor system and maybe increase income that way. But our annual book sales will be no more. Actually, they were semi-annual, large ones, and then smaller ones throughout the year. We just can't do it anymore. And that's what we're here for, is to ask for your help. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Mr. Powell? During the pandemic, uh, I did a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. My mother's Dorothy Powell, so the senior center is important to me. Yes. But I took down 47 books that I had read, and they were all in good shape, but I didn't mean to be in uh, stealing money. I'm uh, not stealing, but, <laughs> <laughs> but taking money from what you were doing. The ones I had, I just gave to them. Sure. And, and uh, I heard you talking toward the end of this toward that so mm -hmm. yeah, and that's good. what you know <laughs> we have had people donate wonderful books to us yes. there was a gentleman who um, was associated with the Reagan library and mm. when he passed away we obtained a lot of books from the Reagan library the history books were phenomenal we put them out at the museum when we had our book sale there they were the first to go people just could not get enough of them so we, we do get, we used to get wonderful donations, um, but unfortunately, that's not happening now. Matt, hey, thanks for your presentation, and it's, it's neat to see Amber. She's just like beaming back there when you talk. <laughs> so I know you help her a lot. Um, so if you had a, if you could get a space, whatever mm -hmm. this is, what would it look like square footage wise? It possibly? would look about 1,900 to 1,000 so square not, feet. Not huge or anything? No, I mean, no, we don't okay. need huge. We just need permanent. Enough space for us to accept donations, um, have a little place to sort them, have enough shelving to put them on the shelves. Um, and that's about it. I and, mean, and you'd be open more often. You said that. Uh, we'd be open every day. We have enough members that someone could be there every day um, to sell and to 
um, what we thought we would do is each of us would take a genre, um, mysteries, romance, history, biography, whatever, and then as the donations come in, they would man section. their section. Yeah, yeah. So we had talked at one point in time on the community rec center that we might put a branch, a library remote branch at the at the rec center. So and there's a there's actually quite a bit of space at the rec center. I, I know Steve may not think so, but that it, that lobby is huge, um, and maybe there's something we could look at uh, at the rec center, Steve. Maybe so um, that might be something we can ask Mr. Hardesty to take a look at and see if there's some dedicated space that he might be able to find. Now, that you understand that when the donations come in, they come in boxes because people just box, or sometimes bags, bags of books. Right. And so you will have traffic in and out of wherever the location is dropping off donations. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think that there's got to be some solution. And when you say our, meaning our peer center, our... Dorothy Powell Center, that's mm -hmm. the city, the city, the communities. Right, the they're communities. Not, they're all of ours. It's mm -hmm. not just our. Gotcha. <laughs> so, we don't okay. own them, okay? You all own them. Gotcha. So, okay. I didn't I just want to make sure. <laughs> I just want to make sure we're clear on that. So, and we understand that. Your city council understands that. Is there anything this left? Is, this is a community owned. Over there with the gym and the other things. Are they being used or still? The or? gym? Which gym? Auditorium. Well, the auditorium. Oh, well, no, the auditorium, the auditorium and then is, the gym itself. The gym yeah. has roller derby folks in it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know well, about the classrooms that are over there, Larry. I think Do they've we? opened up a store for they? Yeah, I'd as far as the rec center space, the old rec center space, the the space is unusable uh, due right. to a variety of um, issues, repairs that need to be made. Yeah, so that that's kind of off the table. Um, Have you explored the ever the Evergreen campus? That's as a I do potential. Not know that we have. No. The I would encourage you to reach out to. The new Scott Raymond, who's the principal over there, the online school. I mean, they, they're operating as an online school, and they have teachers in there, but there might be an empty classroom, or yeah. I don't know how they're utilizing the library right now. I'm assuming it's open for kids to go in. Okay. But there might be a partnership there. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Potential. And it's Good something idea. we could mention to the new superintendent as, we, as he comes on board. That would be great. Put that on my list for next week. Good morning. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank good you. I really appreciate this very you bet. much. You know, we, you know, we, you know, we support you. So. And you know, we support you. That's yes, right. you do. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. You had an entertaining presentation, and thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh yeah, more. all right. There's more. <laughs> I'm Lorraine Hadia. I'm new to Casa Grande. I've been here about a year, but love the friends of the library and been going the past couple months. But one of the other things I was looking at is, can we have ongoing sales like at the rec center, for example, that big lobby? And I talked with Kevin at Bow Wow Thrift Shop, and I think their books are paperback about a dollar, and the hardbacks are anywhere from two to five, uh, depending on the you know condition and size of the book and whatnot. But they're making $100 a day on books. That's kind of their bread and butter. And I approached him to say, hey, can we maybe have donation books come in from the library and then split, split the book sales? But he didn't want to do that. He just wants to keep it pretty much bow wow. But that just really shows how much people are interested in books. And then there's also the Casa Grande bookstore that's also, I, I understand it's somewhat new. And Tina, Tina DeSanto is the one who is owning that. Um, I invited her to come to the past few library meetings, but she wasn't available to come yet. Uh, but I love the creativity, and if we can figure out how we can just get the books visible, I think they're more, if they're visible, people can buy them. If they're in a closet and in a 1,400 square foot you know, place that they can't see them, that's not as um, maybe beneficial as if they are visible all the time sure. and we turn them over. So thank you so much for your creative thinking for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Amber, closing <coughs> remarks? 
I just want to say thank you to the friends who came and, and stood up the, in front of the, the council and gave their pitch for space. And tonight's presentation was really about financial support that the friends provide. But they provide so much more. When it <laughs> In the future, when we have a need to go before the voters, or when something legislative somewhere happens that affects the library, these are the people that I'm going to call. These are my advocates in the community. And it's more than just the friends. I mean, it's more than the library that they support. They support all of the, the programs that the city provides, the educational programs. We partner a lot with the schools, with, um, with the courts, with the justice system, anything that we can do to help just about anybody else. The friends are there, and they're willing. And I, I just really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Amber. Mm -hmm. Well, we know where your heart is on that. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have any other comments or questions? <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you all for uh, your presentation. Uh, okay, Larry, what's next? We have the city manager's office, but I think that Stephen, maybe you're going to kind of kick this off? Yeah, I can introduce. Okay. Um, so as you know, uh, we hired Deb Brunner. Brunner. Uh, she comes with us with a lot of experience, both in the private and public sector. She's our transit manager. She started about two months ago. She's been busy. And we thought we should uh, come to you and just give you an overview of transit and then also where our next steps are so that we can actually get buses running. And so I'm going to turn it over to Deb, and she's going to run through her presentation. Thank you, Stephen. I <clears throat> I wanted to begin by saying that I'm recovering from losing my voice, so I'll do my very best. I may have to stop and start and let some air gather up before I begin again, so that would be the reason. But uh, it's my pleasure to be here today and, and finally meet all of you, and um, it, it's just really great. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of what we're doing here at the city. And <clears throat> let's make sure I can do this I'm not even sure where I'm aiming, Stephen. Okay, very good. Here you go. All right. So <clears throat> today, what we're, what I thought we would talk about. I know you've had some presentations before in the past, but I thought we would talk a little bit about public transit, um, how it's funded. Talk about the FTA, and then we'll get into some of the. We'll take a closer look at what we're doing, our planning efforts, <coughs> and what the service is going to look like down the road. <clears throat> Oh, so excuse me. So a lot of times people misunderstand the terminology between transit and transportation. And quite simply, one involves the movement of people or goods or animals. And, you know, it can come in many forms, um, air, land, rail, space, water. Uh, and then Transit falls under that transportation umbrella. Transit is one of the vessels, if you will, under that overarching umbrella. And the American Public Transit Association, it's an international <coughs> nonprofit association of about 1,500 public and private agencies. And so they're the go-to for data, uh, uh, advocacy for transit across America. And down at the bottom of this slide, I've just prepared some, some interesting facts. I think we don't realize how much transportation actually occurs here in the States. You know, we go to Europe and, well, I'm a transit geek, so when I'm in Europe, I will take a look at, I will ride the bus over there or rail or whatever it happens to be. But here in America, you know, there's nine, in, in uh, 2019, 9.9 .9 billion trips were taken. That's a lot. That's an awful lot. And if you look at this, this the facts here, um, it's an investment in, in reduction of carbon emissions across our country. Uh, they're reporting that traveling by paratransit PT, excuse me, public transit is 10 times safer than driving in your automobile. 
Um, so it's something to think about as we move forward. <clears throat> and some other, another interesting fact I wanted to share, uh, I dug this up um, after I submitted this for you all, is uh, APTA does a, a fact book, and the data is behind by a few years, but nevertheless, in 2017, there were 6,800 organizations that provide public, trans public transportation across this country, 6,800. That's about 30, 136 systems per state, if we don't count the territories. So that's a lot of transit being provided. I know we don't do 136 necessarily in Arizona, but you know some states have more than others. But that's a <coughs> lot of transit that's happening. And, and of those, about 3,300 are public transit agencies. And surprisingly, the majority of the services they operate are demand response. And that's the kind of service we plan to be operating. So how is public transit funded? Well, I think the first thing that's important to realize is that it's, it's a subsidized service. Transit doesn't pay for itself. An agency, the federal government, or public private partnerships make up the difference uh, to provide this service because it is for the general public. And <clears throat> funding is allocated through Congress. And the FAST Act, which you may have heard of, which is the Fixing America's Surface Transportation, that's the long version of it, uh, is the funding bill that provides multi-year funding for transportation, including transit. So that's a federal funding source. Another uh, funding source is state revenues. Now, some states like uh, Jersey, Delaware, New Jersey and Delaware, they, they operate tr public transit on a statewide system. So cities and counties or nonprofits, they're not operators. It's state run. So they look at property taxes, income taxes, all different other types of uh, funding sources to pay for transit. Then there's local revenue, so that would be more of something that would uh, pertain to our city, where you're looking at general funds, user fee, license fees, or some other special tax that an entity may put together. <clears throat> there's funding opportunities in investments, in bonding, and uh, that's typically a, a rail project, like a light rail service that is going to be many, many millions or billions of dollars over a multi-year period of time. Public-private partnerships, I talked about that. And then the other revenue stream is actually the fare box, and that's what the actual riders pay to provide the service. So that's just the very quick overarching it, it, believe me, in each one of those, you can drill down into many, many other little subcategories. Now, <clears throat> the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, is one agency or department under the US DOT. And we happen to be located in Region 9. There's 10 regions. So it's California, Arizona, Nevada, uh, Hawaii, Guam, and the Mariana Islands. And <clears throat> what is really great about um, Region 9 is we have a dedicated liaison for our state. And you've worked with her in the past indirectly. Her name is Ariana Valle, and she assisted the contractors and city staff previously in our efforts to become a 5307 recipient. So we've already, as a city, been working with the FTA uh, at getting us off the ground and getting us moving forward. <clears throat> and I would like to mention for a moment um, just, I'm kind of a little trivia person, but under the US DOT, it includes, as I said, many departments, and, and some of you may not be aware that those include the FAA, the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, the Federal Railroad Association, or Administration, the Great Lakes Lawrence, Great Lakes Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation, the Maritime Association, National Highway Safety uh, Administration, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, and then finally the Inspector General for the DOT. 
So talk about umbrellas. We talked about the trans transit as a part of transit, and then you have this overarching US DOT. So a lot going on with transit and services. Um, I will also mention that annually funding is appropriated through Congress. It's a formula. It's based on your performance standards in the past and also by population. So if we look at this next slide, and I do apologize, it's hard to read, but if you get your binoculars out, you can see that under the 5307 category, which is how we will be funded, um, Arizona receives $33 million just for that. Then if you look at a more populous state, for instance, California down a few lines, they're getting 10 times more, 331,000 just in the 5307. So that's just a snapshot of how the money's allocated. And then there's different funding sources, 5311, which are uh, small rurals, 5310, which is for elderly and disabled, and then the 5307 for the larger urban. We're a small urban. Now, how is public transit funded in our community? Well, as a 5307 recipient, we receive 5307 funds, and our allocation right now is about $910,000. Now, when we use that, there's a federal match required. And depending on the type of expense, it's either at 80% or 50%. But we're not there yet, because we have CARES Act funding uh, to the tune of a little over $5.5 million. There's no sunset on that at this time, However, I did attend a conference last week, and the Region 9 uh, um, chair or uh, uh, director indicated that we should probably be using it sooner than later and not, not hang on to it. So they haven't announced anything, but I would suspect they're trying to get us to use it. It was a one-time allocation from Congress to assist transit agencies uh, stay whole. A lot of services, as you know, uh, did not operate or they reduced their hours, or they maybe modified their service. Well, what that meant is there was employees that either were not drawing an income or they weren't making as much as they were used to. So it made people whole by being able to pay for salaries during this time. It also assisted in um, um, by providing um, uh, people who could no longer go to congregate meals, like to senior centers or things of that nature. Uh, buses were used to deliver meals to their home. If they couldn't travel to the meal, special arrangements were made. Um, special arrangements were made to take people using CARES funds again to locations to get their shots or boosters or COVID testing. And also in a few situations, buses actually became mobile clicks to get your shots and boosters. So it was, it's been a, a real interesting situation that we're living through instead of just reading about in a history book. In addition to that funding, there's the local revenue, and that's the local match we talked about. And that would be sources that the city would kick in. And then the fare box recovery. So again, when we launch the service, there will be a fare-free period. But after that, we will implement a fare structure. And that's another revenue stream. So the fare box recovery and the local revenue uh, will contribute to, um, well, we will um, supplement the um, local fare box recovery with a, a local revenue. So if we take in more revenue, it reduces the local match that's required. And then ADOT, <clears throat> very soon, we hope, or I heard possibly next month, we'll be introducing a, a notice of uh, funding opportunity for 5311 buses or bus facilities. This would be an opportunity for the city to apply for a grant, it's competitive funding uh, for, for vehicles. And in the past, I was here uh, when you had a Ford Transit, the large pop-up van you took a look at, real nice vehicle would work swell in this community, or something like a cutaway bus. These are the types of vehicles, if we so choose to, you know, at the council's pleasure, we could apply for uh, funding. Now, 
because I was a former ADOT employee and I did review and score and award, I do know that a new operation like us, we're, we're not proven, we don't have a track record. So if we were fortunate enough to be awarded, we may only get one vehicle, although I think we should ask for four. So if we choose to go down that path, but I just, just wanted to put that out uh, so we can be thinking about it. And the nice thing about the funding source here is that it's an 80 to 85% federal match. And it's so high because the vehicle would be ADA accessible, so the federal government pays more towards that. Now, <clears throat> I'm, I'm drying up again, so I apologize. Uh, public transit comes in different modes. There's the fixed route bus service with complementary ADA. That's a really large operation. And locally, I think Valley Metro would be a good example of the big buses and then the smaller paratransit buses. Then there's the deviated or flex route and they, the interchangeable definition. Uh, City of uh, Coolidge operates the Cottonwood Express. That's a, a deviated service. Gila River, uh, Indian Community, those are deviated services. And then demand response, which we plan to implement is operated in, um, well, Maricopa, the city of Maricopa is going through some changes, but they've had the dial -a ride service that they did weekdays, and then they had one day where they went to Chandler and one day when they went, came over here to Casa Grande. So those were demand response, if you would call the day before um, or the week before, depending on which of those services, um, and, and you would get a, a ride either one way or round trip. Uh, obviously, there was a fare involved, and, um, and then same day requests would always be taken if the service could fulfill it. So the thing about some of the attributes of a demand response service is, A, it doesn't operate on a fixed route. Um, it's a shared ride service. Well, so are the other services, but it's not a taxi. You know, Someone may be picked up or dropped off before you reach your destination. And one of the ways I like to explain <coughs> it, it's many origins and many destinations. So again, I think that speaks to the shared ride. And it's a curb-to-curb -curb service. So <coughs> the transit's going to drop you on a corner, which is great. But our service is going to go a little bit further, and I think really it'll bode well in our community. If you <coughs> notice on your desk, <coughs> You have a little handout, it's called What is Demand Response Service and What are the Requirements? I just prepared a little more detail for you to take a look at it on, in your opportunity. And then at the end of that are some common transit terms and definitions. You know, it's uh, just something you might want to refer to in the future. So for the, our service, our, our, our planned demand response service type, uh, as we mentioned, it's going to be a shared ride. The goal is to contract the service out, uh, make it a turnkey so that a contractor will come in and they will, they will operate and maintain the vehicles. They will hire and train the drivers. They'll take care of customer service issue, at least frontline, and if it's escalated, certainly uh, myself would be involved. The public can sp speak to me as well, but we like the contractor to be able to Take care of something. A lot of times it's just a matter of misunderstanding. So public education um, can correct that in many, in many instances. They'll take care of the reporting. They'll take care of the co uh, collection of uh, material uh, and fares as well. And our service is going to be operated within a service zone. So the trips will begin and end within that service area. So at this time, it's very finite, but as we grow, we can expand that. Um, that's where I think we're going to have some, you know, some oohs and ahs or boos or what. But you know, we've got to start and take our baby steps and then move forward. And there's no priority given to age or trip type. So it's, uh, trips are reserved on a first come, first serve basis. One of the things we need to talk about is how old may a child be to ride alone in the bus without a guardian supervision? So we'll come back, I'll come back in the future before we launch service, and we'll, we'll have all of this stuff drilled out and presented for 
discussion and approval. We'll also offer travel training, and I think this is going to help serve us a lot. If um, someone has never ridden in a bus before, or they haven't done it in a long time, you know, there's apprehension. Oh, I don't want to get on the bus. I don't know how to use it. Well, we would have individuals work with a travel trainer, and honestly, that's something I think I would do, I, I love to do. It's a one-on-one -on -one training experience. We'll explain, how do, you, how do you call and schedule a trip? How do you use the app if we have one? Uh, then we'll ride with that person, show them how to pay the fare, how to go, how to get onto the bus, how, I mean, how to do it from beginning and end. And we find that that breaks down a lot <coughs> of barriers. And it's also good for children uh, or seniors. And if, if people um, want to travel in a, in a buddy mode, you know, that might make it a lot easier for them. And, and lastly, one of the benefits of our service is there's connectivity with CART, the uh, Central Arizona Regional Transit. So a uh, passenger can travel to Coolidge to Florence. They can also travel to Eloy to the Love's truck stop or Greyhound stops. So those are uh, kind of value added, if you will, benefits. So when transit is, um, how do we measure it? How do we know that we're meeting our goal and expectations? Well, there's metrics or key performance indicators. And these are not all of them, but these are certainly the more important indicators. So when we put out our request for proposal, we will have established, what are our goals? How many trips do we want to see in a year? Now, we're going to be a startup, so we're not going to be too rigid. But we're going to have a fare box recovery revenue. Um, the feds like to see 10%. We won't be there for a while, but we'll get there eventually. That's our goal. We want to make sure there's no missed trips. We want to monitor the, uh, the number of complaints um, and the other uh, aspects of this. We will not be owning the vehicles, but nevertheless, we want to make sure that they're being maintained and they're safe and maintenance is not deferred. So those are the things where I will be delving in. And I have a lot of experience with contract oversight. And basically, when we get the proposals back, whoever we award, we're just going to hold their feet to the fire. If you said you're going to do this, then just do it. You know, that's my job, one of my jobs. So here's a number of things that are in progress at this time or will be in the near future. And there's administrative startup documents. Um, we've applied to become a, a national data, NTD, National Transit Database user, because annually we have to report all of those metrics I spoke about a moment ago. We also have to have all these plans sitting on a shelf, and some of them have to be reviewed by the FTA. Once we've met those requirements, then I'll be coming back to council for a resolution <coughs> And uh, we can, um, we would submit that to the FTA, and then we can begin actually drawing down for any expenses and begin using our CARES funds. So we'll be putting out a request for proposal, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a little tongue twister, um, later this summer. Again, we're looking uh, ideally for a turnkey operation. Um, I've worked with Stephen and others and we're looking at, uh, um, and Dwayne, and we're looking at other locations possibly within the city where the contractor could be housed. Uh, with the new technology, perhaps a contractor call center and scheduling would be off site somewhere, but on site they would need just a small office space. Uh, they'd have a computer maybe to log in, do emailing with their corporate office, uh, to uh, pick up supplies, materials, have a break room. They would report. We looked at the knock uh, location, and it's a it's possible. Nothing's been determined at this time, but it's it's possible that the vehicles would be parked out there. The drivers would report. They could leave their vehicles. Uh, they could do bus washing there. They could do fueling there. They can get air and water. So it's very convenient for the operation, non mechanically, and um, and the other benefit if. We're planning to get fuel carts for each of the vehicles that will be used, so we're not paying retail costs. And again, it's more convenient. They're not out at a service station. They're at a big, wide, open area where they can fuel uh, with minimum you know, problems. 
Um, we'll be looking at a fare structure, which I mentioned earlier, and that'll probably be one of the first major tasks that our TAC, our Transit Advisory Committee, will be involved in. Um, staff will make recommendation, we'll review with the uh, committee uh, before we come in, uh, to council with a recommendation. <coughs> and, and the TAC, um, I, you know, they're volunteers and it's typically comprised of the bus riders, stakeholders, maybe employees of industry or service in, uh, agencies that um, support public transit, like maybe a senior center or the area agent on aging, area agency on aging, um, along those lines. And then we would probably have one or two members at large. Because people might be interested, but they don't work or they're not involved in those realms. Now, this is kind of the fun stuff, and we need to go through some branding. We, who, who are we? How, I mean, we know who we are, but what do we want our transit service to look like? What, um, so if you take a look at these slides, uh, Douglas Rides, Kern Transit, you know, it's the city of Douglas, and, or it's the county of Kern. But they've developed a logo that says what they are, but it's, 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 it's slick and it's, it's interesting, it's easily identifiable, and that's the kind of thing we're gonna be looking for. Ideally, we could also do a bus wrap. Now, surprisingly, this is the same vehicle. This is a before and after. And the white bus is your typical transit vehicle. It's got some stripes and a logo on it. But the red one, boy, that's got some impact. And, and you can see that's yeah. gonna get a lot more attention on the road. It says who you are and you got a phone number. And you might also notice on the front, it's easier to see on the red bus, there's a bike rack. I think eventually, if we don't start with it, we should get uh, bike racks on the front of the vehicles so that a bus rider, uh, who is also a, pit, a bicyclist, can ride the bus for a portion of their trip and then finish it or begin it you know, with, with a, a bus. And that's very common. So this is exciting. And then this is a lot of other um, important background work that I'm working on. You've, we've got, we've got, once we figure out what our logo and our name's gonna be, we can get a domain and then integrate it with the city website. We'll have a dedicated phone number we own, but the contractor would be, you know, they'll be picking it up at wherever their call center is. Um, we'll work with the, um, uh, the startup with their drivers, um, and then of course the marketing and outreach. I plan to do a lot of lunches and clubs and agencies and talking and you know all of that other good stuff, working with our PIO's office and newsletters and all the departments. Uh, and then you know anything else someone has creatively, I'm more than willing to go talk and introduce the service. I feel like we'll be successful, but it, it would be nice if we start with a bang somewhat of a bang. So that's my presentation. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy. Yes. Mr. Powell, I was watching this and, and you get your tickets from dispatch. And I thought, what in the world has a newspaper got to be doing with tickets for bus rides? And it was, you have a dispatch center which makes tickets available, right? Well, the dispatch center, um, to some extent, um, that's correct. But ideally, an individual would phone in to a call center, or, and, and they'd be a call center or dispatch at, to schedule their trips. Or if our contractor has an application, they can be doing it from their smart device or from their phone. And then you take that, that whole voice, that you know, one-on-one -on -one with a live person element out of it. Um, I say we use them all if it's gonna be available because you know, individually, we all like to do things differently. I know I'm of an older generation and I prefer to pick up the phone, but some of the younger folks, um, you know, they're more in tune with using a device, a mobile device. Like a Lyft. So as far as ticketing, there's nothing that you actually get. Uber. You're just scheduled. So you would call in and, you know, I'd say, this is Deb Bruner and I live at 123 Elmwood and um, I need to be picked up tomorrow at 9 a.m. And I'm going to uh, 1374 5th Street. And they'll say, oh, okay, well, 
you know, we can be there at 9.15. Oh, yeah, or we can be there at 9. So we'll set the time. If there's any questions from dispatch, they'll verify it with me now. And then tomorrow, I will wait for my, my trip. And if we're really fortunate, uh, maybe at some point down the road, uh, we can integrate into our service something called an IVR. And honestly, right this five second, I forgot what it stood for. But what it would do is you would schedule a trip, and then the following day, 30 minutes before, and then 10 minutes before, you're going to get a phone call, reminder, that the bus is going to be out there. So that's a really neat service because, you know, there's nothing worse than showing up and someone canceling or say, oh, I forgot. So those reminders help, especially if it's 30 minutes before. Lisa? Well, first of all, I'm just so happy we're here at this point. Um, I'm, I'm sure Dwayne and Larry have told you it's just been something that I've been an advocate for for a long time, especially yeah. when some of our surrounding cities have this type of service. And I really do feel we've done our due diligence over the last two or three years conducting surveys and holding um, meetings for the public um, and getting feedback. So I'm happy to see someone like you that's coming in to take this on because it makes me feel confident that we are going to give it 110% when we roll this out. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, 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 I'm pleased to see that some of the concerns that we've had as, as a council over the years are in your presentation. You know, oh, it looks like you've addressed a lot of the issues that we've discussed, and so I'm sure our staff has communicated that to you. Um, I really, I'm excited about it. I, you know, the, the timeline is great. Of course, there's gonna be some skepticism, you know, initially, especially when it comes to the, the route, um, you know, not the route, but service the, area. Um, the, the service area. Yeah. So I think that, you know, before we roll it out, I'd really like to take a look at that one more time, just yes. to, you know, to make sure that we know exactly. And I think the collection of data is gonna be critical, mm -hmm. um, you know, on, on where people are coming from and where they're going and everything. But, um, yeah. and, and I noted, you, you talked about the fair, uh, one thing that I didn't see on here that I, I wanted to make sure we took a note of, because as I've talked about um, transit in the community, some of the social service agencies and employers have talked about vouchers, how they would like to provide some type of voucher, some type of credit, some type of card um, to some of their employees or some of the, 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 um, the individuals that they serve. So if you can maybe incorporate that in your fair um, strategy because there are agencies and companies that do want to to be involved in and provide that and maybe you know we've talked about sponsorships too mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. of um, you know private companies maybe wanting maybe the hospital or some of the big employers might wanting to sponsor so okay. um, that wasn't on here too but but no I'm, I'm so happy you're here Deb it's great be meeting you and looks like we're, you were in good hands having you with us so thank you thank you and 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 thank you very much um, <clears throat> Brother, you had a question. Did you want to finish your thought? Well, I was, I was, <clears throat> I was just going to say that um, I have given some thought to other types of fair media, or yeah. we've we've talked about it, and that would definitely be something we would roll out. So we we would be looking at that, and we talked about some sponsorships. So okay. we'll definitely come back with some ideas. Yes, thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Deb. I just have two quick questions. Uh, the current supply chain issues that are going on, do you anticipate that may be a problem acquiring the vehicles? Or do you, are you aware that they're readily available to go? Well, I think that's a great concern that you mentioned. Uh, as I, uh, Last week I was at a conference, uh, the uh, Arizona Transit Association conference, and there was a bus expo. So I had an opportunity to talk with the dealers. And new, new buses, many of the buses are 18 to 24 months right. out but there are a lot of the provider the, the big companies and smaller ones as well they may have vehicles um, that they can draw from other locations uh, i know that that was recently done in sedona they op they they just began operating a, a special trailhead shuttle and their contractor pulled three vehicles from three different states. They pretty much look alike, but the way they made it cohesive and identifiable was with the wrap and the artwork. So a bus can pretty much look alike, 
whether it be a cutaway like we looked at on the slide or a van, you know, if we had a combination of vehicles, I don't really think that that's our big concern to get started. Okay. Um, yeah, if that answers your question. The only other concern I had was when you said 11 to 17 riding alone, I'm hoping 11 to 15 year olds cannot get on without parent permission. Okay, okay. That's the middle school principal in me that says we don't want this to be. <laughs> the teacher's coming out in him. Yes. But how do you give permission? Come with a note on the well, I would assume the parents would be the ones arranging the rides. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's where that, that travel training comes in. Right. And so, you know, maybe, maybe that's something we could consider. But we'll come back with, with some recommendations on, on how old you think a child should be to be able to ride alone. Mm -hmm. I've operated services where kids can be six and older. I'm okay with them riding alone, just with parents, parents aware that they're on it. Okay. I think Matt had a comment, and then I'll come back to you, Don. So, like Lisa, I'm pretty excited to be here, but I will tell you I wasn't a big proponent of this five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we had meetings about this. We've been working on this a long time. And as I've gotten more educated and we've gotten these programs, I'm getting very excited about doing this because we figured out a way to do it where it's not going to cost a whole lot of money. It's going to be beneficial to people in the community. And I, I hope Ralph, Ralph Rayla is one of the ones that really, uh, he was on the council before, and he really helped me figure out and see the light about how this works. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to see it finally happen because there is a real need for mm -hmm. this in our community. One thing that I will say I think is going to be important at the beginning is the I know you had you said you had the travel training, but also the education of how it works yeah. and where it goes. You know, I yeah, mean, yeah, just yeah. to make sure to manage, as Larry taught me, manage the expectations of how this is going to work. Because it's going to be great. It's going to go most places everyone wants to go, mm -hmm. and it's going to work good. But we just need to make sure and tell people you, you can get from here to here in the zones and how the zones work and all that. And I also, uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm sure you're, I'm glad you came here with all of your experience and everything, so I'm glad to see someone like you taking this and getting it going. So um, I think you answered all the questions and the type of service that I think will be best for us to start out with, and mm -hmm. I hope that it grows, you know, and, and we become somewhat uh, self-reliant uh, yeah. with funding and everything. So thank you. And again, I, I'm glad to be here now. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and that wasn't always. Donna? Um, yeah, thank you very much. You gave us a, a really good amount of education on this, and I think with your you expertise, you're going to guide us what? in the right that direction. Else? Um, like Mr. No, Lavender, no, the no, age no. Um, group kind of concerned me, not so much for the kids riding alone, but the safety of the kids that are riding, and mm. just to ensure that um, the backgrounds of those people driving. Um, I know that, that we have service agencies in our county that put <coughs> foster kids eight, nine years old in a cab and send them across the county, and I'm, I'm always concerned about that. Yeah. So I think that for us to do our due diligence on the background of those people driving is really important to me. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I, I just wanted to mention, um, you had said, I think that try to, to handle some of the complaints at their level, will there be any kind of reporting mechanism where in quarterly reports that we'll be able to find out what the complaints are and how they were handled? And not just complaints, but you know the, the kudos as well. I'm just wondering about that. Absolutely. Um, I've, I've spoken with uh, Stephen about that, and, and I believe that what we will formulate is a monthly or a quarterly update you know maybe you know, i don't need to come to council but you know i'll just be sending some information your way or, or monthly you know here's some ridership figures here's complaints you know that those metrics we were talking about mm -hmm. here's what's happening so we can see the progression and again a lot of complaints are just misunderstandings yeah, and, and some, some of that can be also funneled through mr rains he he gives us a weekly update fantastic and so maybe even okay. once a month or Every other month, even just some sort of update through his through his communication, we get we get a weekly update from oh, from okay. Larry every week. Okay, perfect. And it covers perfect. lots of different topics. Perfect. Okay. If, if I may, um, Councilmember McBride, um, the drivers uh, we would build into 
our agreement that background checks are absolutely necessary uh, because the last thing you want to do is have you know some social some sort of predator behind the wheel of a bus so those that screening would be done thank right. you All right mr powell you had a comment question yeah i just wondered i think it's come to a point where it's probably a good idea for us to do this do you think and the uh i think we're there I, all I was going to say is I would like to see a budget uh, basically on how, how it's going to run money-wise. I know they say none of them ever made any money except uh, going back and forth in Las Vegas between downtown and the Strip. But uh, that would be interesting to see. It, it's, I'm not going to vote against it because of that, but I'm just curious what it is. Okay. <laughs> definitely have a budget. We'll definitely come back. Yeah. Okay, still. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Deb. Oh, Mayor, Did, Mayor oh, go ahead. Bob, go ahead. I, I had a question as well. Um, I, I'd like to hear your opinion on, we, we kind of, as, as a group, we came to the conclusion that this point-to-point on-demand uh, process was, was the best fit for our community. I'd kind of like to hear your opinion on if, if you think that's best for us or, or a traditional bus route. And also, you, you had mentioned that the city of Maricopa was going through some changes or transition. I don't know if you know the details on that, but I'm kind of curious because they, to my knowledge, they started off with more of a traditional bus sure. route and they went to a point to point on demand. And if they're changing from that, I'd be curious what you know about that. Uh, sure. Um, your first question with regard to service type. Because we're, we're new and public transit has not been operated in this community before by the city, I, I think an on-demand is probably a really good place to start. Uh, we we got to get people tuned into using the service, what it's all about. And then as it grows, as I believe it will, we might find down the road, a few more years, that with the city's growth and expansion, you know, we, we will be operating perhaps a fixed route. Um, and, and, and that that would be the need at that time. But for now, I think the, the fixed route is, or excuse me, the on-demand is a good option, and, and we'll just grow from here. Okay. And with regard to your second question in Maricopa, um, they are taking it in-house. They will be operating their service in-house now. I'm not sure when that starts. I actually believe it begins the first of next month. To the best of my knowledge, they will still be operating their fixed route service, but they might, I've heard, and I don't know for certain, they might be uh, making some changes to their, their dial rights. So they're offering two different types of service. They started out with a demand response like we have, and then as the city grew and you had more origins and destinations, they, op they began a, a, the fixed route service. So, I, I don't At know point, what Maricopa, they're doing. <laughs> sorry. At one point, Maricopa wasn't getting enough ridership. Yeah. So they decided to take residents up to shop at Chandler Mall. Yeah. Bad which idea. Which takes the money out of town, and you yeah. don't want to see that happen. But That's a bad idea. Yeah. 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 And they were doing another day where they came here yeah. to the promenade, and then connections yeah. with the well, That was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. That was a good idea. <laughs> Well, they can bring their people here yeah. still, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, follow up. Have, have you, do you have a counterpart at Maricopa? Have you met that person? Or, and, and the reason I bring that up is I think they're two or three years ahead of us in this endeavor, and I think there's some lessons to be learned uh, from them. So I, I would encourage contact with city of Maricopa and... I don't actually think they have a dedicated transit manager. So they're doing things a little differently. Um, but I was hoping to speak with someone from the city last week, but I, I didn't find anybody there. So I'll, I'll reach okay. out. Yeah. I appreciate that. I would do that. Yeah, if you need some help with that, let me know. Absolutely. <laughs> I have some people I know over there. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and just to kind of in, in closing, thank you, Deb, for, for uh, your presentation. And I know we've been talking about this for a while. And to uh, to Lisa's point, you know, uh, I think I think we're all excited about it coming 
to fruition and, and it's getting started. And one of the things we talked about was because of this on-demand type service, we could actually track data, right? Track data in terms of destination points from and to. Mm -hmm. And so using that then to maybe grow our system or to educate ourselves on where the need is, right? Where, where's right. the need in our community? Right. So that's the primary uh, purpose, obviously, transit is we have people who need it. And so we want to make sure we track that data and, and then obviously communicate that back to, to city staff and to council. Okay. And obviously we can make adjustments as we, as we move forward. So appreciate all the, all the work. I would, I would add one thing, and, and Lisa mentioned it, and uh, Donna kind of mouthed it also. But we, have, we do have some ideas in terms of this it that we have in Casa Grande. <laughs> we love it. You know, we park it. We you know, work it. You know, all the Save it's. It. Save it you know, for our water conservation. So how about ride it? Uh, with our logo. Yeah, with the logo, ride it. And anyway, work, work with our PIO. <laughs> work with the PIO uh, and, and Rebecca and, and company up and, and Latanya, uh, and even our Chamber of Commerce. Uh, she's kind of the gatekeeper on the it uh, logo, but it could be fun. Uh, there's passport. It's kind of a passport look. So you know maybe. We could even do a passport stamp, you know, as people ride. And uh -huh. if you get 10 stamps, you get a free ride or something. And there's lots of different stuff you could do. It'd be kind of fun. But, but no cousin it, right? No what? No cousin it. No. No cousin, okay. no, no cousin it. <laughs> no. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank you for your presentation. All right. We're a little past 7. Uh, let's start at 10 after. Everybody good with that? Yep. So it'll give us about 7 minutes, and we'll start the city council meeting at... 710. Thank you, everyone.